Hey everybody, it's Mr. Wagstaff. Cool stuff to talk about today as we start a new unit on the Cold War. So, we had World War I, and then stuff got crazy, led into World War II, then crazy stuff continues to happen, and it looks like World War III is going to happen again, this time between the United States and Russia, and the rest of the world is going to basically be a victim of this massive, ridiculous war that's going to happen. Um, uh, spoiler alert, it ends up not happening, kind of shockingly that it doesn't happen, but for most of the 19th century, the almost war, which is going to be referred to as the Cold War, we'll start talking about today, is really on the forefront of everybody's mind, as in what is the future of not only uh, these countries, but humankind as a whole going to be like. Anyway, let's just go ahead and jump into it today. Cool stuff to talk about. So the latter part of the 1900s or the 20th century is going to really be the tensions that arise between the United States and Russia or the Soviet Union. And I'll explain to you how those are kind of interchangeable at this point in history for this course. Uh, because it gets crazy pretty quick. Let me just jump in and explain one specific thing that helps understand why there's tension between the United States and Russia. Uh, the United States had used the atomic bomb in World War II on Japan. Russia is going to develop it almost immediately after World War II as well. And while America only had two atomic bombs uh, on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we only had developed two, once you know it works, you can mass produce them. And this is what Russia and the United States does, is we mass produce these atomic weapons where if a war happened between Russia and the United States, not only could it wipe out both our entire civilizations, it could wipe out humanity as a whole with the nuclear fallout from these weapons. So this isn't just your normal tensions leading up to a war. Basically, the fate of humanity is resting in the balance between these two superpowers after World War II. Now, immediately after World War II, there is this group called the United Nations that still exists today. So we're so far here in this course that we can start using more or less modern pictures of things that still exist today to kind of explain how it works. So immediately after World War II, uh, and, and you might be thinking to yourself, wait a minute, Mr. Wagstaff. You're talking about all this tension between Russia and the United States. Weren't they allies in World War II? Yes. And the alliance quickly splits. And we're going to talk about that here today of where this tension comes from between Russia and the United States. Now, it's, it's no secret as we've talked about in here, very different ideas on how society should be run. Russia is communist. Uh, totalitarian uh, dictator still at this point with Joseph Stalin uh, and America is a democracy uh, which is a government run by the people. Two very different views of how society should be run and with the rest of the world in tatters after World War II the argument really becomes who is going to exert their influence on the rest of the world is it going to be America or Russia and shape the rest of the world in their own image which was the goal of both America and Russia on all these other countries that had been dilapidated due to World War II. Now, a very positive, before we get back into the negative, that does occur directly after World War II is the creation of the United Nations. So the United Nations is an agreement on every country on Earth. We'll just simplify it here. Everybody agrees to come together and join an organization, unlike the, uh, tr uh, you know, the uh, League of Nations that was created after the Treaty of Versailles, which is for only a select group of people, the United Nations is for everybody. And this is a modern picture of it. It still exists today. It is still a uh, very well-respected and powerful organization. Uh, every country on Earth shows up here uh, multiple times a year. Uh, and they are going to basically air their grievances. Uh, if they got beef with somebody, they talk about it in front of the rest of the world so that everybody can be on the same page of what's happening. This is supposed to keep people like Hitler and Mussolini from rising to power again uh, and letting tensions get so high that it, it escalates into a world war. So it is important that every country show up. America was a big supporter of getting this created 
However, by the end of World War II, it is obvious Russia is like doing their own thing. Russia being a, a superpower, this doesn't work with everybody coming together to talk about it if everybody doesn't do it. So Russia, it is very important to get Russia involved in the United Nations. And Russia, because of the concessions that were made by FDR at the Yalta Conference, in which we needed Russia to help out with Japan at the time, Russia had agreed there to join the United Nations, and they do. So the United Nations, this is a big win. Everybody's going to show up, talk about stuff, try to prevent World War II, uh, III from taking place. So this is what it would look like, uh, what it does look like uh, here uh, in, in more of a modern uh, a meeting area. But this is exactly what it looked like in the 19, late 1940s, early 1950s, when it was just getting started. It looked the exact same way, even though this is a modern picture. While the President of the United States is not necessarily the diplomat, all types of important, the most important people on earth politically will show up and give speeches here at um, the United Nations in front of the rest of the world. Uh, this is the last, this is Barack Obama, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, uh, all give speeches at the United Nations at some point in their presidency. Uh, very, very, very important establishment for everybody getting together and talking about what they feel is the most important thing facing Earth. So it's a good thing people uh, get, get together for this. Talking things help, helps prevent drama. Now, uh, one really cool thing here is everybody speaks different languages. If they're all sitting here in this room together, how do they understand what the people speaking are saying if they don't speak that language? Well. If you've never thought about that, or this is all new to you, you probably wouldn't have thought about it, but I've thought about it, and this is really cool. So look at these like windows, almost like box seats here uh, that are up here on, on the wall. What is up there, all right, is translators. People uh, go, whoever's speaking, somebody that can speak that language, and, so they represent a country, whoever the translator is, uh, they can speak the language, whoever's giving the speech, and they are translating it for their own country. So uh, you'll see these the, the, the big clunky white uh, uh, ear microphone things. It's just such a common random thing that they still use in the United Nations. It's like been there since the 70s. Uh, you would think they would have like uh, AirPods or, or something fancy now. But as of uh, uh, 2022, this is still what they use. Uh, so, uh, but they what they're listening to is their translator up in the booth basically translating whatever's being said into their language so that they can hear it. So whenever somebody shows up and they say something really controversial, which does happen, there's tons of stories and they'll show up and being like, and I hate that country. And then the people that are being talked trash about, they're like, they're like, he'll say it. And they're like, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Wait a minute. And it's like a delayed reaction as they're getting the translation. Um, but uh, so the United Nations still exists today. This is the countries involved in the United Nations. If it's a, if it has a color on it, it is part of the United Nations. So, uh, uh, 1942 was the very first idea of this uh, with Winston Churchill and FDR. Uh, but then, by 1945, it becomes like official at the very end of World War II. And again, very important that the first two countries that really joined this is going to be America and Russia. Because, again, if either one of them didn't join, it would be completely useless because those two countries clearly are the ones that are going to have beef in the world and the basically the fate of the world relies on those two countries getting along. So very important that Russia and the United States both agreed to join the United Nations and meet however often they choose to meet, at least once a year. I think it's mandatory two times a year. Uh, and basically talk about any issues that they have. Now, the difference in this... And the Treaty of Versailles, or the League of Nations, is that this actually has teeth. Meaning, one of the stipulations here is this organization can declare war on a country. Meaning, the entire world can declare war on a single country. The United Nations has that power. Uh, now, because it's a little, you know, like say you're Zimbabwe and you're doing something crazy that the rest of the world wants to declare war on, uh, it has to be a unanimous vote. It means when they vote to go to war, it has to be unanimous. Well, if every country got a vote, then 
it would never be unanimous because, like, if everybody's voting to declare war on Zimbabwe and Zimbabwe's like, no, it would be a, you know, not a unanimous vote and therefore you couldn't declare war on Zimbabwe since they voted no themselves. So there is, and this is really important for this unit because we'll reference this quite a bit. This is still in place today. So what happens is there's five countries plus an extra 10 countries that get voted in and, and rotate over time. But we're pretty much just going to talk about the five countries that are the permanent members of the thing called the UN Security Council. This group of five countries decides, with the help of the other 10 that change over time, uh, these five countries decide whether or not the United Nations, meaning the entire world, declares war on a single country. All right? So, there are five countries here that are permanent members. These five countries have to agree, has to be unanimous among these five countries in order to declare war on one certain country. So, not surprisingly, the United States is one of those countries. Uh, and when the United States shows up, they like to bring, bring along their, their friends, France and Great Britain. Uh, so, uh, Great Britain meaning England. So, France and England, they're there with the United States. They're always going to vote the same way. Russia is also on the UN Security Council. Ru <laughs> Russia is 100% not going to join the United Nations and not be on the UN Security Council because then everybody would just vote to declare war on Russia. Uh, so, uh, you know, Russia is here. So obviously Russia or the United States can't declare war on each other using the United Nations because they all five have to agree here. And we've just talked about four so far. And obviously the United States and Russia aren't going to agree eye to eye. Like if Russia's trying to vote to declare war on America, America's going to vote no. And if everybody's trying to vote to declare war on Russia, they're going to vote no. So the fact they're both on the UN Security Council, in theory, people are like, okay, this should help prevent World War III if they can't declare war on each other, you know, and at least pull in the rest of the world. So the fifth country is obviously after everything that had happened in the Pacific with Japan. You're not going to allow Japan because you know, there's war crimes and things dealing with Japan after World War II. Uh, but it is obvious that Asia is like 60% of the world's population. So China uh, finally gets acknowledged on, on a world global stage as they should have been for a long time that they are here uh, to represent uh, that hemisphere almost. Uh, so these are the five uh, permanent members of uh, the UN Security Council. If these five countries agree to go to war, they all go to war. Now, present day, these are the same five, but present day, this is the flag for Russia. Present day, all right? But because it was a USSR, and we're going to talk about what that means here in a second, this is the flag that always gets used uh, uh, throughout this course uh, for Russia, which uh, represents the Soviet Union, the USSR, and we'll talk about that, what that means today. Uh, so this is a list of frequently elected UN Security Council members, like that other 10. They pretty much follow the lead of the permanent five. Um, this is a, a cartoon here. It's kind of like everybody's like playing poker here at the UN Security Council. Everybody uses politics. It's supposed to be a politic-free place, but we put a bunch of politicians together. Everybody's kind of got a trick up their sleeve. This is kind of uh, supposed to be them playing poker, like kind of gambling, like what trick up the sleeve do, do they have? But the UN Security Council has the ability to declare, have the entire world declare war on a single country. So that's the teeth of the, U, of the United Nations that other groups have not had in the past. So the question here is, what was the purpose of the United Nations? What was it trying to prevent? Uh, and why was it important that both Russia and the United States join it? So pause me, answer that completely, and we're moving on. All right, so now that we understand the UN, let's talk about some of this drama, and we're going to kind of move quick here because we kind of build on all this stuff. So there was this meeting at the end of World War II called Yalta, where the big three showed up, the United States, England, and Russia. All right, Stalin, uh, Winston Churchill, and FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt of the United States. That was the Yalta Conference where Russia agreed and Stalin agreed he would allow all the countries he controls after World War II to have free elections. Well, then right after the war is over, they have to meet back again, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. So the big three show up again, the same three countries, 
But FDR has passed away, so Harry Truman shows up in place of FDR. Clement Attlee shows up in place of Winston Churchill. So this is what the Potsdam Conference is. The only original member of the Big Three is Stalin. The, re the reason Clement Attlee shows up instead of Winston Churchill, and this is kind of weird, but it, it's worth mentioning, everybody in England loves Winston Churchill being this fantastic leader during World War II. And as soon as World War II was over, there's a new election, and Winston Churchill gets voted out of office in place of Clement Attlee. And you're like, wait, I thought they liked Winston Churchill. They loved Winston Churchill. Then why did they vote him out? They're tired of war. Winston Churchill is associated with being a wartime leader. They wanted somebody that was a peacetime leader, so they voted the guy in that's basically going to lead England into the future. So that's why Clement Attlee uh, takes the election over Winston Churchill. Well, Stalin shows up here, and Stalin's like, I don't like this. Because remember, Stalin's a dictator. He's here for life. And so Winston Churchill, or uh, sorry, Harry Truman is like, all right, so Stalin... As you promised, let any countries that you have, you know, have free elections to choose whether they want to be owned by you. And Stalin is like, I don't think I will. I'm, um, I'm going to make them all be communist. And, and uh, Clement Attlee and Harry Truman are like, whoa, 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 whoa. You promised England and America that you would allow them free elections. And Stalin says, I didn't promise y'all nothing. I promised Winston Churchill and FDR. Now, while Stalin probably would have broke his promise anyway, that's probably how Stalin viewed it. That he didn't make it a deal with a country. He made a deal with an individual person. And since they're not there, deal is off. And he was like, yeah, everything that we talked about at Yalta, out the window. I'm taking over everything that I can. This is the equivalent of taking off the white glove the old time and like slapping your opponent in the face and be like, ha ha, I have disrespected you. Stalin isn't pulling punches more metaphors here of hitting people uh he's not pulling punches he's letting america know we're not friends anymore i want to do whatever i want and there's nothing you can do about it uh so from the potsdam conference on there's a lot of tension between the united states and russia and you could say this is kind of the start of the cold war because russia says i'm going to take over everything i can and the people i take over aren't going to have a choice they're forced to be communist so the question is, how did Stalin change his stance on how to restructure Europe from the Yalta Conference to the Potsdam Conference? So basically, t tell me what he lied about at the Yalta Conference. Like, what promise did he break? How is he going to do things differently? And what's his motivation for it? So pause me, answer that completely, and we'll move on. So I will use the term satellite nation, USSR, Russia. I use a lot of these things interchangeably, uh, and I don't want to confuse you. So I'm going to very simply, hopefully visually here, explain to you what the differences are between Russia, Soviet Union, satellite nations, and, and, and all this other stuff. This here is Russia. No, that's in red. That's Russia. Russia is a massive country. A lot of it's above the Arctic Circle, but it is still a massive country with a massive population. All right. So anyway, this is the country of Russia. Okay, Mr. Wax, if we got it, we can move on. All right, country of Russia. So after World War II, Russia, all right, which literally says Russia here, starts taking over these other countries. These are countries that the Nazis and Hitler had taken over that Russia liberates. So when he goes into the Ukraine and kicks out the Nazis, he goes into Belarus, kicks out the Nazis, goes into Poland and kicks out the Nazis. Stalin is then going to own those countries, all right? Those countries don't become part of Russia. They are basically owned by Russia, though. So they have to do whatever Russia tells them to do, all right? Those countries, like basically the country that Russia owns but aren't Russia, those are called satellite nations. They are just an extension of Russia. They literally cannot do anything that Russia doesn't say they can do. They don't have their own representatives, anything like that, like at the world stage. They are like completely owned by Russia, all right? So we have to have a term uh, in, in the rest of the world, and, and uh, Russia creates this as well. What do you call Russia plus all of their satellite nations? Russia plus their satellite nations is referred to 
as the Soviet Union, the USSR, all right? So the Soviet Union is Russia plus their satellite nation. So Stalin is the leader of Russia. He is the leader of the Soviet Union. Whatever Stalin says goes, that is it. So this is a massive, massive piece of territory that Russia now owns. And this is, this is scary because communism, all this red area is communism, is just spreading, all right? Uh, uh, like a like a blob almost. Uh, they don't jump around. It's not imperialism. They're not jumping all over the world. It is all connected as it spreads out through Europe and other regions in the United States or uh, other regions in the world that Russia touches. So the question here is, what is the difference between Russia and the Soviet Union? Because there is a difference there. All right. Uh, so pause me, answer that completely, and we'll move on. All right, NATO and the Warsaw Pact. Once the United States sees that Russia is trying to take over the world and everything that they take over is going to be communist, uh, there's a huge fear of, uh, of communism at the time. So the uh, North Atlantic uh, Treaty Organization is something that America creates. So let me show you a map here. The reason America needs to create basically our group of friends is as we see Russia is getting more and more aggressive around the world, we, we can't really go to the United Nations and complain about it. I mean, we do go complain about it, but there's never going to be a point where we can militarily use the United Nations against Russia because we're both on the UN Security Council. Russia can't use the United Nations against America and America can't use the United Nations against uh, Russia. So we create our own gang inside the United Nations. It's America and all of our friends. And it's called the North Atlantic Treaty Organization or nicknamed NATO, right? Uh, which is the abbreviation of it. So NATO is America and our boys, basically our ability to stand up to, uh, Russia. Cause again, the United Nations is useless since uh, Russia and America are both on the UN Security Council. Well, obviously, once we get our gang together, and it's clearly directed directly at Russia and the spread of communism, Russia doesn't like that. So Russia creates their own gang called the Warsaw Pact, which it is kind of weird that they have their own little gang name when it's basically just the Soviet Union. Uh, but whatever. So the Warsaw Pact is... Uh, Russia's response or the Soviet Union's response to America creating NATO. So if you were looking like from the North Pole, uh, this is a huge part of the earth that has basically turned into two separate gangs, right? There is NATO, North Atlantic Treaty Organization, which is America and our gang. And then there's the Warsaw Pact, which is Russia and their gang. Now I want to point out here, and this is important, all right? The blue here are people that are in NATO. The red is the Warsaw Pact. There's a lot of people that are not in either. So everybody on this map here, everybody is in the United Nations, all right? America and their friends are in NATO. The Soviet Union and their friends, they're in the Warsaw Pact. But uh, we'll go back to Zimbabwe again. Uh, Zimbabwe is not in either, but they're still in the United Nations. All right, so while everybody's in the United Nations, which is a huge umbrella, not everybody is, is in one of the other two gangs. Madagascar just hopes that doesn't get wiped off the map with a huge nuclear war between uh, America and Russia. So the question here is explain what the difference is in NATO and the Warsaw Pact and why they each felt they needed to exist. Like why did America feel like NATO needed to exist why did the Soviet Union feel like Warsaw needed to exist? Uh, so uh, explain that, pause me, answer that completely, and we'll move on. So we had already mentioned here at the very start here, because I want that to be up front. Everybody has nukes, or Russia and America have tons of nukes that can absolutely be cataclysmically bad. And in future lessons, we're going to talk about how the nukes had gotten much stronger 
it is pretty obvious here. Uh, so all the red areas are satellite nations that the Soviet Union has taken over. Uh, like Czechoslovakia here. Czechoslovakia has already been taken over by Russia. If America tried to go invade Czechoslovakia to prevent it from being owned by Russia, this is the equivalent of, I mean, because you would be invading the Soviet Union, which is an extension of Russia at the time. It would be like attacking Russia, and that's just going to cause World War III, and pretty much everybody dies. I mean, the absolute, again, we'll talk about the weapons advancement here. It's, it's wild. You don't want World War III, but both sides want to exert their influence, and Stalin and Russia are spreading through Europe. So instead of like taking back over Czechoslovakia or Hungary, there are places here uh, like Yugoslavia, Austria, Italy. They are going to be kept from becoming communist, right? So instead of forcing communism to go backwards, because any attempt of that will cause World War III, they're going to contain it. Don't let it spread any further. We draw a line in the sand, any place that's not already communist, America and our buddies go and just try to lock it down to try to prevent communism from spreading. That concept is called containment, because you want to contain communism. Now, because the Soviet Union, as it spreads out, kind of does so, like, with countries that are connected, once a country becomes part of the Soviet Union, they have no connection with the rest of the world at all. Like, phone lines, mail lines, railroad, everything just gets cut off. Soviet Union, fully self-supportive. So, if you have family members that, that happen to be in a country that get taken over in a satellite nation, you lose all contact with them. They can only communicate with people inside the Soviet Union, and the Soviet Union, anybody in there, can't communicate with anybody outside the Soviet Union. So, Winston Churchill, who's still alive at the time, giving speeches, and is still very famous for his efforts in World War II, Famously gives a speech in which he calls the border between the two the Iron Curtain. All right? Uh, because nothing goes in and nothing comes out. You don't, nobody travels inside. Nobody comes out. There's no communication. You don't know what happens on the other side of the border. Uh, there's not an actual wall there. All right? Even though uh, so you, uh, cartoons like this make it look like, and it's called the Iron Curtain, make it look like there's a wall. There's not an actual wall there. If you're like, I feel like there's a Cold War and a wall situation that's the Berlin Wall, and that's a separate story we'll get to in a future lesson this unit. But there's no wall, actual wall, the Iron Curtain. Now, if there's a road that's like going into it, there's going to have like a couple of tanks there, some soldiers. You're not going to like just walk right into the Soviet Union because uh, there's guards all along the border. But it is called an Iron Curtain because there is like an iron solid divide between the two civilizations that do not interact, which is either you're part of the Soviet Union or the rest of humanity. Uh, so the border gets nicknamed the Iron Curtain. So the question is, explain what the Iron Curtain is, and is it an actual wall? So pause me, answer that completely, and we'll move on. All right, so the Cold War, all right? Basically, America and Russia both want to be the ones to take over the world. The world is in shambles after World War II. America wants to go in and rebuild these countries to make them democracies. So the Soviet Union wants to go take over these countries and turn them into communist countries. Uh, two very different ideas. And because there's these two different versions and ways of basically taking over the world, America and Russia start being very hostile towards each, each other. So this is kind of... Uh, a drawing here of Stalin spreading out throughout Europe, placing the flags like in more satellite nations he can take over to expand the Soviet Union. And America does not want that to happen. So the big fear is with this tension, with both sides being very stubborn on wanting to spread their culture and refusing to accept the other person's culture. This really feels like this is going to lead to World War III. It felt inevitable at the time. And if World War III happens because of nuclear weapons, it would annihilate the entire Earth, whether people got involved or not. So this time period, because, spoiler alert, the world doesn't end. That's why you're watching this right now. Um, 
So in history, since this war never takes place, and it was surely going to, what do we call it? So in history, we refer to this rising tension between Russia and America as we both try to take over the world in our own image as the Cold War. Uh, I guess like a hot war would be where people start shooting at each other. The Cold War technically, you know, you, you, you had to find a reason, or like what to call this tension, and it's referred to as the Cold War. So the question here is, explain what the Cold War is and why was it called this? All right. Uh, answer that completely. That's as far as we'll get. See you guys tomorrow. Mm -hmm.